so I'm just going to talk about a, some of the things that were going going through my head today um, while I was in the round pen. I was starting a cult this afternoon, and uh, j- these were just some of the things I was I was thinking about. What happens when you hire somebody to start a cult for you? What what's going on? What the process is? All these kinds of things. And I, I think a lot of people don't really understand this, and so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just throw it out there for the big iron world. So the, the very first thing I want to talk about is the business of starting colts, the business of horse training in general. And I don't think a lot of people think of it as a business or, or really understand this as a business. And, and it, I totally understand that. If, if you're an a architect... It kind of seems like a horse trainer is is somebody that just rides around and has fun all day. Uh, I'll take you back. I don't know. This has been 12 or 15 years ago when, when my wife and I were starting colts on contract and we were just going from place to place and we'd, we'd be somewhere 60 days and start a bunch of colts, go another place and be somewhere 40 days or however long we did it, however we set it up. Um, I was talking to a gal and she said... She says, you mean you just travel around and start colts? And I said, yeah, I just travel around and start colts. That's what I do. And she said, man, what a fun job. And I said, yeah, it is a fun job. And she says, I'll bet you never have a day when you wake up and don't want to go to work in the morning. And I said, no, I'm almost half human. There are days when I wake up and don't want to go to work in the morning. This, It's still work. It's still a job. And, and all of us there, there's some days when we don't want to do it um so, so that's the first thing that i think people need to realize is that it is a business it is a job people professional horse trainers um we we've we're just contractors and and yeah there's days we get up and we don't want to do it there's days that are great there's days that are fun most of it's great and most of it's fun. Um, but it is still a job and it is still a business and we run it like a business. We try to run it like a business. So that's the very first thing I want to talk about. Uh, most, the vast majority of horse trainers work a fi- have a five-day work week. Like I said, we're almost half human. So we still like to take our kids fishing too and and do weekend things and, and do things like that um almost all of them work five days a week i'm kind of a six day a week guy but that's just sort of how i'm geared uh on on day six i'm at work and i'm doing things i may not be riding i may not be riding your horse i may be floating teeth i may be cleaning my barn i may be doing a whole bunch of stuff but may not be riding. And, and most guys just ride five days a week. So with that said, if you've got a horse in training, you need to call and make an appointment when you want to come see your horse. That you, If you just drop by, you're, you're dropping by a place of business where people are trying to do work. And they can't necessarily accommodate you or, or stop and talk to you or tell you about your horse. There's things that need to be done every day, every minute of the day, just like in any other business. So make an appointment. Just just text. And texting is best because horse trainers don't really want to talk to people. Just send a text and say, hey, can I come out Tuesday at 10? Again, like I said, we all have families too. And Tuesday at 10, we might have to be at a wrestling match. No, I can't make, we can't do Tuesday at 10. I'm, I'm taking a couple hours off there. Going to make them up on Saturday, blah, blah, blah. Just, just work with your trainer the same way you would work with a mechanic or a roofer or anybody else that does contract work. Uh, the other thing is, if, if you can, if the only time you can get off is Sunday morning, well, there's a good chance that the guy that's riding your horse, the only time he can get off is Sunday morning too. That that's that's his only time off. 
horse trainers want to, they want your business. They want to work with you. That's great. They're going to work with you and try to help you out and, and give you a chance to come out and see your horse. But, but just remember that that might be the only time that that trainer has a chance to, to take some time off and spend with their family as well. So just think about these things. We're not just out there. We are out there having fun, but we're not out there just having fun. We're also doing, doing a lot of work and it's a place of business. So that's the first thing I was thinking about. The next thing I was wanting to think about or wanting to talk about, cause I was thinking about it, um, is what happens when you, when you send a horse to training. So you send a horse, uh, send a horse to go get started. And that's, I'm kind of, the person I'm picturing here is a, um, a white collar professional that, that rides really well and does some stuff, but goes ahead and sends their horse to a trainer for X amount of time. Not necessarily going to show or anything like that. You send a horse off. What exactly is going on? So, first of all, like I said, almost everybody are five-day weekers. So that means in 30 days, your horse is getting um, eight days off. So 22 days. 22 days of work. I think my math's right on that. Anyway, um, a lot of people seem to think that way back in the bygone days, the master horseman of old discovered that 30 rides was this magic number that horses brains work with and incrementally learn in 30 day periods. But that's just billing 30 days is cause that's easier to build that way. That's why we do 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. It's just cause it's easier to build that way. There's a completely random number to the horse. The horse doesn't know 30 days from three days. It's, it makes no difference to the horse brain. So 30 days isn't 30 works. Isn't dang sure isn't 30 rides, especially the first 30 days. Um, but it isn't 30 works. It isn't 30 rides It is a billing period. So almost everybody that's 22 days of work in your 30 days. What happens in those days of work? Um, so those first 30, if you send somebody like me a colt to start in those first 30, how many rides is that? Well, I do a heck of a lot less groundwork than other people. I've just got my groundwork really consolidated to, and it's in a system that works really good for me. But there's about the first four days are purely groundwork. This isn't a perfect world. This is if you send me a horse that isn't messed up in any way, shape, or form, and everything works correctly the way it's supposed to. About the first four days are pure groundwork. By the fifth day, I'm on the horse and, and riding it around. If the horse has been messed with by almost anybody else, it's more days of groundwork. Um, if you think that, oh, I can do all the groundwork at home and then, then send the horse off, I'll get more bang for my buck because all the groundwork's already done. The, whoever it is can just get on the horse and just go right to riding. That's not going to happen. It, if you do that to me or anybody else, I'm still going to do all the groundwork I would have done anyway because that's how I get my neck broke. If you say, I've already done everything, and I go, oh, great, that's fantastic, and just step on the son of a gun. That's how I get a broken neck. So I'm still going to do all the groundwork I was going to do anyway, and chances are, if you're not a professional horseman, you didn't do the groundwork right. And because it's harder than it looks, it's not, you're not just chasing them around the round pen like it looks on RFD TV. So chances are you messed a bunch of stuff up. So if you already did all the groundwork and I can just get on the ride, I'm probably going to have to spend more days groundworking that horse to get it the way I want it to where I feel that it's safe for the horse and safe for me to ride. So 
don't do that. But then also, if the horse hasn't been touched since the day it was weaned and it's just been running loose and you gathered it up with the dirt bike and bushed it in the trailer and, and bring it to somebody without a halter on or anything like that, well, there again, I'm going to have to do a heck of a lot more groundwork. So there's some mediums in there. In a perfect world, within five or six days, I'm on that horse. Um, those first handful of rides are going to be, if I can make it fit, perfect world again. If I can get everything the way I want it. I'm just going to be walking around in the round pen. I will walk around a couple of laps this way and stop. And turn into the fence and walk around a couple of laps this way and stop. And turn into the fence. And then I'll stop the horse and back it up. That's going to be the first couple of rides. It's going to be 10 minutes tops. If I have everything perfectly the way I want it. Um, sometimes there's a little grabbing and there's some running and there's some this and that. But we're just going to walk. After that, usually within the first week, I'm out in the, in the big arena. And I'm still just walking and trotting around. That's what's going to happen in the first 30 rides. Or the first 30 days. Um, actually, even a lot of times the first 30 rides is just walking and trotting around. And what I'm going to do and what pretty much everybody else is going to be doing is just trying to teach that horse, one, that we can influence their movement with our aids, and two, to be confident, and three, we're working on their fitness. Working, trying to get them fit enough that we can do more than just walk and trot around and kind of stop and turn around. But we're, we're just going to be go, stop, turn, go, stop, turn, go, stop, turn. That's all, that's all we're really doing. It, if everything works out correctly, I don't even get a sweat on a horse in the first 30 days. So with that said, if you send your horse to basically anybody for less than 30 days, you wasted your money. You just threw, threw your money away. Because pretty much everybody that, that knows how to do this is doing it the same way. Those first 30 days or so, we're just trying to get our horse fit. We're just trying to get our horse confident. We're just trying to teach our horse that we can influence the way they move. For me personally, if anything... If the, if the colt ever tries anything, tries to be naughty or whatever, however we want to phrase it, bucks around, does anything like that, it for me, it is almost always right up to or right after those first 30 days because that's where they finally got fit enough and confident enough to try something. By fit enough, I mean they're literally strong enough to try to do something with the weight of me and a saddle on their back and confident enough in the sense that um, they've finally figured out how to carry my weight around and how to balance with me on them that that they figured out they can try this. That colt may have been, he may have been wanting to try to buck with me since the first ride, but just wasn't confident enough. Um, so it's really with right around that 30-day mark that anything ever happens with the horses I ride nowadays. Years ago, when I was a wild-eyed pistol waver, and I'd just step aboard, it usually happened within the first three rides. Um, but I do things a lot differently now. And I think, like I said, everybody that's, that's making a career out of riding young horses are doing it real similar to the way I'm doing it. So... Um, if you only send a horse to somebody for 30 days, that's why I say it's throwing away your money. If you only send a horse to somebody for 30 days, all you've done is paid somebody else to get that horse fit enough and confident enough to try you. That's all you've done. You leave that horse for 60 or 90 days. Now if that horse tries something, it's my job, it's my responsibility, it's my my job to work through it um, and I'm planning on that when I start a colt I'm planning on about the time this horse starts 
starts being pretty fit and being pretty confident, he's going to try. It, and it might just be playing. It might just be playing around. But that goes back into the confidence part of it. That Colt has finally learned about stall life, living in a stall. Uh, a lot of the nervousness of, of being in a stall and being in a barn, which a lot of them aren't in until they come to us. A lot of that's over. Uh, there's probably, by that time, they're getting a little body sore. Body fatigued, I think, is, is more appropriate to say. And, and yeah, that colt might be thinking, I don't mind if this guy rides me once in a while and bosses me around, but this son of a gun, he gets on me and bosses me around five, six days a week and tells me what I'm supposed to do. And yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll try you at that point. Um, and that's okay. That's, that's part of the job. What my job is and what every other cult starter in the world's job is, is not, our job is not to get the buck out of him. Oh, I sent him over to Brett and he knocked the buck out of him. Um, that's a, that's a bronc twister's job. That was my job for a long time. That's kind of how I build myself and I was, I was really good at that. But that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to teach that horse. I'm trying to balance that horse, try to make that horse really confident. If that colt, like I said, if that colt tries me, why then I'll, I'll deal with it. But in those first 30 days, that's not going to happen. I've learned how to do this and it's not going to happen. Um, part of why it's not going to happen is because that is when it's the most dangerous for the horse and for myself in those first 30 days. The horse isn't strong enough to buck. And so that, that's when he's going to hurt himself if he tries it in those early days. That's when he's going to pull tendons. That's when he's going to blow stuff out. That's, that's when he's going to hurt himself. Um, and then as far as hurting me, bucking me off is your two-year-old's not going to buck me off. We're not worried about a two-year-old bucking me off. That's not why I'm worried for my health at all. Your two-year-old's going to fall on me is there's where I'm worried about my health. So I'm worried about that two-year-old hurting itself trying to buck or falling on me and hurting me trying to buck. And I'm really, really fast, and I can get away from them suckers to this day really, really well, but I'm getting older every day and getting to where I can't get away from them as fast, so I'm even more worried about them falling on me than I ever was. If you're in the school that, well... Uh, I don't think two-year-olds should be started. I, I think we should wait till they're three or four, and then they, they're less likely to hurt themselves. Um, first of all, you're wrong. They're more likely to hurt themselves when they're bigger and stronger and have more air. Second of all, if you bring somebody like, like me, a four-year-old, I'm not going to ride it. I'm going to tell you to take it home. It's not because I can't ride it. It's not because I don't want to ride it. It's because I can't lope enough circles in the arena on a four-year-old to teach it all the things I, I want to teach it. Bring them to me as a two-year-old. If you want to wait till they're four, that's fine. They are more likely to get hurt, but you need to take them to somebody that's on a ranch that can put six or eight rides on them in the round pen and then go use them on the ranch and let the ranch teach them. And trust me, that's way more fun. Like all of us, all of us that ride colts would rather do it that way. The trouble is there's no ranches anymore that have enough miles to do it that way. That's why I ride colts for the public and I'm not a ranch cowboy anymore because there's hardly any ranches left that, that have enough colts to do things or have enough miles to do things that way. So th those were a bunch of the things I was thinking about today and, uh, I think I had a bunch more points that I was trying to think about, but off the top of my head now, I don't remember them. So get your Colts to a professional. Get them to them as a two-year-old. I do remember one of the things that I wanted to talk about as soon as I was ending this deal. Um, the 
that cold I've got that, that I was working around when I was thinking about all this, she belongs to a guy that can start a cult. He can darn sure start a cult. He was ranch raised. I don't really know how old he is, but he's probably started 50 or 75 cults in his life. He can do it. And, uh, but he, he brought her to me because I've started way, 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 way more cults. So I'm less likely to mess up. It's not that I can do so much of a better job. I'm way less likely to mess up. That's, that's where the real deal is right there. Um, cause I've already messed up. I've, I've, I've messed up so many times, messed up so much stuff. And, and that's the learning process. But you, John Q. Public, have a big investment in this horse, in buying the horse, in the facility that you've built, in sending the horse off to somebody, blah, 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 blah. You've got a big investment in this. That's what you want. You want the best for the colt. So if you take that colt to a professional, they are less likely to mess up than you are. Or then so-and-so down the road that is a welder by day and starts a couple of colts every evening. That's send them to a professional. There's that. And, and I think that's a really wise decision. I think that's a good way to spend your money. If you are one of these people that wants to start the colt and go through the whole process of finishing it and have it be all you. I totally understand that. I understand where you're coming from. I understand the, the mindset and where you're thinking. I also think it's really, really selfish. I think that you're, you're doing something for you. You're not doing the best thing for your horse. I've got another video that you guys can search around in the archives. We call it the 40 year old version. Uh, where I talked about, I, I spoke to a guy that he was in his forties. He'd ridden horses a lot, never started one. He wanted, wanted to start one. And I told him how I thought would be the best way to go about that was. I think if you, if you go through that process that I talked about in that video, you're going to be all right. But if you've just been to 17 clinics and read a whole bunch of books and you like to put your chaps on at night and sit on the couch and watch Buck the movie, you're going to mess that horse up really bad. Like, put your chaps on and watch Buck the movie. That's great. Go to clinics. Audit clinics. Read all the books you can. Get around all the people you can. But don't think that makes you qualified to ride horses. To, to ride colts. Pardon me. Don't think that makes you qualified to ride colts. I started riding colts when I was 11 and I was buying ponies off the reservation that I, I was giving like 25 bucks a pop for them and ruining lots and lots and lots of them. And chances are because I was 11 and I was buying them off the res, there's a better than average chance that part of those horses were older than I was at the time. That's, I learned by wrecking a bunch of them. And so if you've got this dream of being the first and only person that rode this horse and took it from zero to a finished horse, that's great. That's a cool dream. Get a mentor, get, get help, get a, a trainer to help you out with it. Like I said, go to all the clinics, read all the books you can, put your chaps on and watch Buck at night, eat popcorn. That's fantastic. But you're being selfish if you don't have a professional start that cold. At, at the very least, 60 or 90 days, have a professional get on that horse. And um, that's, that's going to be what's best for your horse. So we're out of here.